There is literally millions of these things on the road and you're looking to buy one possibly. What can you expect to fail if you buy one? Let's get started. So these are pretty popular, whether it's Suburban, Escalade, Tahoe, Sierra, Silverado. There's so many iterations of this chassis all over, really all over the world, but especially all over America. There is a lot of questions that could be had. I'm looking to buy one of these. What kind of things can I expect to fail? We're going to go over some of those things today. They really apply to the 99 to 2010 range. Once you get into 12 and 14, they start changing things. There's things that are failing that are not common to these era. So 99 to 2010, we're going to talk about what can you expect to fail. And the things I'm going to show you today, they are going to fail on one of these at 100,000 miles or more. You can go ahead and budget it in, in your uh, annual budget or your monthly budget, whatever it is that you do. You can write these things down. They will fail. So let's start in the engine bay. So we'll go ahead and move this shroud out of the way. This is the 5.3 liter with active fuel management and we'll talk about that also as well, but probably not one of the ones I would want. I would want an earlier one without active fuel management. But anyways, here's our intake manifold and if you follow it all the way back behind, you'll see a shield back there. Behind that shield is an oil pressure sending unit. You can't see it, it's hard to see right now. It's actually hard to change out. I can do them without removing the intake and they're not fun. These are known to fail and leak oil all over the back of the engine, making it look like a rear main seal is leaking or something's bad going on when it's not. They're also known to fail and your oil pressure gauge will show zero or sometimes all the way past 80, even when the engine isn't even running. It's a very common failure point. I personally, in the years when I was working at a different shop, probably changed out 300 of them. They fail over and over and over. So if your oil pressure on one of these vehicles we just mentioned goes to zero, it probably is not your engine just dying on you. It's probably the oil pressure sending unit. So if you're buying one of these, you can budget that's going to fail. It will fail. If they fail, it's typically a couple hundred bucks, the cost of the sensor and some labor to get it replaced. It's really not that big of a deal, but plan on that happening. The next thing we're going to look at is this 175 amp mega fuse right here. You can actually see it's a little corroded on the connections already, and we'll clean that for the customer before it leaves. There's so many times that a customer with an Escalade or Tahoe or whatever complains of a no-start condition, I tell them to wiggle the connections there on that fuse and boom, it starts. It's just a common point to get corrosion there and it gets a poor connection. If you have issues with it not starting, wiggle the battery connections, but definitely try that fuse right there. Usually what you have to do is take the nuts off, clean all the connections real good with down to shiny metal, put grease on it and put it all back together and it'll be good to go. But that has happened so many times, so plan for that. Luckily that last one, if you had a shop do it, it'd probably be $50 or less, but you could do it yourself for free. So it really is not that big of an expense. The next one is a huge expense if it fails. Underneath the intake on this one, you can see that there's a plate that has little zigzags. It looks like a maze or a labyrinth with all kinds of little pathways through it. Those are oil ports for the active fuel management system. We all know this to be problematic on Chrysler vehicles just as well as Chevrolet vehicles where lifters stick or they turn, different things happen, it just destroys the engine. It's really a poor, really a crappy design. Many people will electrically disable it like a tune or something. They'll turn that feature off and some people will go as far as to just take the cylinder heads off, take everything apart and go back together with standard lifters, standard camshaft and just completely delete the active fuel management out. If it has had poor oil change history, you can bank on one of those failing on you. It starts ticking or clacking really loud or just dies on you. So that is definitely a problem on these engines. Now you can budget for that if you want to go the full delete path, at least $4,000 or more. Remember, the heads have to come off. This isn't like Grandpa's Chevy 350 where you can pull the cam out pretty easy. 
You cannot get the lifters out of this vehicle without pulling the heads off. You can plan on that as well. Try to get the earlier ones, 2007, 6, 5, 4. There is no active fuel management in those years, and that would be where I would go. Here you can see the AC compressor, and you can see that the little small serpentine belt already has cracks in it. You can see the cracks, and there's a little tensioner pulley there. I promise you, it will break on you. I promise it will break. Typically on these vehicles, like this one, I see the cracks starting. I either advise them to go ahead and put a tensioner and a belt on it, or we go ahead and offer that service when we start seeing it to fail. But usually what happens is the little tensioner and the little pulley seizes up and throws the belt, and your AC quits. And you really don't understand why or what happened. All I know is my AC started blowing hot. That is usually the problem on these, and it happens so much. It is really crazy. So you can, you can budget that that will happen. Luckily, if it fails, it's not a full AC system replacement. It's just a pulley and a belt, and it's really not that bad of a deal. In the newer models, they actually go to a stretch belt, and they do away with the tensioner altogether, and that pretty much solves the problem. But these older ones with its own separate little tensioner, very high failure rate. So we can see here, there's these little black block shaped things. Those are ignition coils. There's four on this side and four on the other side. And there's red ignition wires that go from the coil to the spark plug. If you get a misfire, typically it's because it needs a tune-up. The spark plugs are so worn out that they've killed one of the coils because the gap is too large. And you would replace that coil and also probably do a tune-up with all plugs and all wires. Another thing I can promise you is if you do a tune-up and you go to pull the spark plug wires off, they will break. There is no way around it. They always break. They, they get so much heat from the exhaust manifold right there that you, no matter what you do, they just crumble. They just break or the wire pulls out. Whenever I do a tune-up and a coil on one of these, I quote all eight plugs, all eight wires, and the particular coil that failed. But that is a common issue on these. A coil fails because the tune-up's never been done. Typically at 100 or 120,000 miles, it's probably time for plugs. And no, don't just do one plug and one wire. Really, you can't even buy just one wire anyways. They're not going to sell you just one wire. But typically, you can expect that to happen. Especially at 100,000 miles, it's just about time for plugs. You just bought this vehicle and all of a sudden starts misfiring. It happens so much. Typically the cost on that could easily be four or five hundred dollars. You got the coil, the ignition wires, all eight plugs, and the labor. It can easily add up. And you got sales tax, which no one ever thinks about sales tax adding 50 bucks to their total. So if you're somewhat mechanically inclined, this is another area where you can fix it yourself. You can get the parts and take care of it and negate the cost of paying a shop to do it. So definitely an option there. You see those rusty little bolts by the spark plug there? The exhaust manifold bolts. Look at there guys, it's already got a broken bolt head on it. You can see the gap already starting on here. That exhaust manifold bolt, the head is broken off. This is a job that's usually 50-50 whether I get to do it or not. It's so common, it's another one you can guaranteed you're going to have at least one broken exhaust manifold bolt on these. They put very small bolts in a high stress, high heat area. I don't know why the engineering did that, but they don't last, they break. And then you start getting the exhaust noise. And so many times I tell them, you know, to fix your exhaust leak, I'm going to have to remove the entire exhaust manifold, which means probably more bolts are going to break. And for every one that I have to drill it out of the cylinder head, it's a half an hour. Every time one snaps, that's another half an hour. And if another one snaps, even if we heat the bolts or use PB Blaster or different things, it doesn't matter. They're so brittle from being heat treated, basically, that they just break. And when people hear about half an hour tallying up so much, they're like, you know what? I'll just deal with the exhaust leak. Forget it. So that's definitely something to look for if you're looking at one of these. Check all the exhaust manifold bolts. You need to be careful if it's, if it's extremely bad it could cause some issues with O2 sensor readings, but if it's just a light leak or this one's not leaking at all, you, you can get by for a little while. Back under the intake again, although there are no knock sensors there, there is the uh, AFM manifold. 
This is the area where the knock sensors are located on the older models, 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. These frequently go bad. You get a code for knock sensor signal issues. In, the, in those days, they put foam blocks underneath the intake manifolds to keep debris or animals out, and it actually backfired on them. It would trap water in there, and the water would get into the knock sensors and just rust them into oblivion and, and ruin the wiring harness as well. That's an intake off job, and you have to replace the knock sensors. It can be a few hundred, three, four hundred dollars to do that job. But if you're looking at one of these older models and it has a knock sensor code, you can go ahead and budget. The intake has to come off, and that is extremely common as well. I've probably done at least a hundred of them, a hundred sets of them, a lot. So we're not doing a full review of the car, we're just showing things that are going to fail. And one of them is the instrument cluster gauges. Those are so common to fail that they're actually mobile technicians that go around and fix them wherever you're at, whether it's at home or at your place of business or where you work. Those people wouldn't exist if this wasn't a common problem. And what happens is your gauges will read way out of whack. It'll say you're going 120 miles an hour when you're not even moving or your voltage gauge quits working. And what they are is the little stepper motors that actually move the needles fail. The whole cluster has to come out and it can be rebuilt fairly quickly. We just had them done on Hoovy's beautiful Suburban, that teal green, what was it called? Riptide Blue. Riptide Blue, yes. The Suburban that he has that's so nice. That's been fixed and it was done very, very quickly. So that's something you can expect to fail. Yes, the HVAC system you've seen in the red truck where we had to replace the actuators while it was all apart. All inside this dash is the cheapest AC actuators that anyone has ever made. Whether it be for the blend door, or the recirculate door, or the mode door, they always fail and they start going click, 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 and you can hear them when you turn on your car and it's annoying. Either that or they just don't move at all anymore. You go to turn the dial to temperature or mode and nothing happens. It's just stuck. And sometimes it is a dash out job, but sometimes you can also get from underneath. There are several that are easy to get to. If you're looking at one of these years I mentioned, Sierra, Silverado, Tahoe, any of these, you can also budget. You will be replacing HVAC actuators. I promise you will. So there's only a couple of things in the interior. And again, you could go on for hours about things that fail on any vehicle. We're just getting some of the high spots of things that I have replaced multiple hundreds of times. So that's pretty much it for the interior. Let's go ahead and get this thing in the air. We're not doing a full review, like I mentioned. We're just showing some of the common items. And again, you guys can probably list a few more in the comments section that weren't brought up in the video that are also common failure points and let other people know. But like I said, I'm mentioning the things that I've seen so many times that I don't even have to, it's just like on the top of my head. So we'll start right here by the radiator. You can see it already has brand new transmission cooler lines right there. It's because they always fail. They start leaking where it crimps and drips all over the ground. You'll have red fluid on your driveway. They all will fail. I've done Duramax ones. I've done the 6 liter, the 5.3, the V6s. It doesn't matter. They will all fail in the lifetime of the vehicle. So that's definitely something to check for leaks. And like I mentioned, the little AC tensioner we just mentioned a minute ago, there it is at a different angle. It's just literally two bolts and you have to take the main belt off as well, but it's not a big job, so just let you guys see that. The next one is the oil cooler block off plate, which is these two bolts right here. These are notorious for pouring oil all over the oil filter and all the way down, and constantly people are getting quoted a new rear main seal replacement when actually it wasn't the rear main seal. It's just this little gasket. Heavy duty vehicles will have oil lines going to an oil cooler, but this one's a block off plate. But regardless if there's a cooler or not, that is a very, very common leak spot on these. It's one thing to be careful with on these is oil leaks right in this area. They can be from multiple different things. It can be valve cover gaskets. It can be the oil pressure sending unit we talked about. It could be that oil cooler block off plate I just showed you. There's several areas there that you definitely want to check 
before you start condemning a rear main seal or something like that. However, the oil pan gasket and also the rear main seal do fail on these as well as the oil pickup tube o-ring which can give zero oil pressure or very low oil pressure when it's warmed up. The pickup tube o-ring is literally just on the other side of the oil pan in the front of the engine right there. And it's actually not hard to get to in these two-wheel drive setups but in four-wheel drive they can be very difficult. It's literally just right in, right in on the front of the oil pan there. It's where the pickup tube mounts to the oil pump. The oil pan itself can also be leaking and making a big mess. It's also a common leak point, but not as common as the oil cooler block off plate. Now this is not a four wheel drive, but if it was, another common leak point on these would be differential seals on either side. I've replaced so many sets of those where the CV shaft comes down, you pop out the flanges, put the new seals in. Sometimes they can be done in the vehicle. It's not that big of a deal, but if it's a four-wheel drive, check the differential. It's probably leaking. I can almost promise you it probably is. Okay, show of hands, how many of you have the Era 2000-2010 Chevy truck and your ABS and brake light is on? You guys know I have a black SS Chevy out, out the side of the building here that I bought from Hoovy from Hoovy's Garage, and its, it's lights are on. Almost all of them are, and it, the reason why is the ABS module, which is underneath the car, underneath where the driver sits on the frame. Typically, the solder joints inside the control module fail or they crack and it loses power and it shuts down. And then you get an ABS light. You can usually remove these little screws and take it apart and re-solder the circuits and fix it. I've done a lot, I mean a lot of those myself. I re-solder them, put it back together, and amazingly, the ABS light goes off. It's happy again. That is a massive, massive failure point on these. This is a 4L60E. And if you're towing a trailer in overdrive, shame on you. You're going to ruin your transmission. Well, let's get this thing on the ground and I'll tell you a little bit more about that transmission situation. Towing anything 2,000 pounds or more is always harder on your vehicle. And there's the common misconception that the 4L60E is a pile of trash transmission. It might as well be a grenade with a pin that just drops off at about 100,000 miles and it blows up on you like clockwork. But I have found over the years in working in a mechanic shop or owning a mechanic shop, 90% of the time it's because someone was really working their engine while it was in overdrive, not in tow haul mode, but just in normal driving overdrive like they're cruising on the highway unloaded. I usually trick the customer. They'll come in and say, man, this thing, is, the transmission's going out, it's shuttering, and now the transmission's shelled out, and these things are piles of junk. So I say, you probably threw it in drive and hit the highway, right? All the way on your trip using overdrive, and they're like, well, yeah, and I'm like, there you go. You blew up your transmission, guy. What do you mean I blew it up? I say, yeah. The torque converter lockup, or the little clutches inside the torque converter on these are not designed to haul loads and put the brunt of the load of towing on those tiny little clutches. It will burn them up, then it sends the debris into the transmission, and then it just scores and destroys everything else. My mentor, the guy I used to work for, told me, if you're ever towing with a Chevy transmission, any of the newer 4L60Es, always, always have the overdrive turned off. Yes, you're going to get worse gas mileage, but I guarantee you the gas that you will lose is going to be way cheaper than a new transmission. These things are not designed to tow in torque converter lockup. They're not. So you can really prolong the life of these 4L60Es if you keep that in mind. You can about double the life of your transmission that way. Now I could ramble on and more and more. I could talk for another hour about the things that commonly fail. And like I said, you guys can let us know in the comments some of the things that you guys have seen that have failed on these. But these are some of the ones, like I mentioned, that I've seen so many times. It's almost like I, I wake up in the night and go, ABS module, AFM delete. That's just, there's so many of them. 
So that's why you wake me up in the middle of the night with random phrases. Yes, that's probably why. Thanks. Now, are these a pile of trash vehicle because of that? No. No, they're not. Because what I just did to this Suburban, I could do to any car on the face of this planet. Every car has high failure rates of this or that, even a Toyota. But a Toyota has much less so. They are still a good vehicle. When the things do fail, they're usually not $7,000 to fix them, and they usually can be done by someone who's a novice, somewhat mechanically inclined. They can usually fix it themselves. Now you can actually watch YouTube videos and get instructions on how to work on it yourself. Now we don't do that here on this channel. This is a review channel. And this is a channel about what it's like to run a shop, the common failure points of vehicles, things of that nature. That's pretty much what we do anymore. If you're curious what kind of tools that we use in this shop, check my Amazon affiliates link in the description below. We get a small cut and we really appreciate it. And make sure to hit the subscribe button because the schedule is full all the way to November. We have cars coming in left and right. And that means more videos for you guys. Thanks for watching.